Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. This is Today with Kino Cummings on Cape Talk. And a very good morning to you. It is 26 minutes to 10, and you are joined by the naked scientist, Dr. Chris Smith. Hey, Chris. Morning. How are you doing? Always good to have you on, so I'm doing really good. Thank you. How was your How was your week? We always yeah, good do a stuff. Bit of a check in with you. It's what been a have? very interesting week. Um, I mean, since I last spoke to you, I went and got a COVID vaccine, which is interesting. Uh, didn't have any side effects from that, and it was very well organised. I'm I'm just waiting for no my trickers. extra arm to grow at this stage. But um, <laughs> sorry, say again. That's that's because what? <laughs> I said no twitches and uh, I was no, not yet. About no, the no. Um, it's while I was on duty at the hospital uh, that they're they're doing all the all the doctors, nurses, and other healthcare people yeah. at the top of the list because obviously you you've got to keep those people going to keep the health service going. So I was able to get a dose of Pfizer's vaccine, and uh, no, no, no extra arms and legs yet. Uh, all going well, as, far as I can tell. Good, good, um, although good, you know, good. I have I have had Bill Gates already tuning in to the microchips that have been injected. So um, I'm sure he now knows all my <laughs> bank account details. And, uh, no, no, it's, and, it's, and, it's hilarious. And, as a matter of fact, our chief our chief justice also spoke about you and said we must be very careful not to find any triple six in those vaccines. Yeah, yeah, so, correct, correct um, yeah. You know, you know. So so just be careful of the triple six there, Chris. <laughs> well, there was a big uh, announcement yesterday. In, interestingly, because I, I was actually doing a radio program last night for one of our network radios we do a, a common sense coronavirus call-in for one of the bbc yep. stations once a week and it was at, around that time that the company novavax from the us announced yes. their phase three results from their stu- their study in the uk because they've looked at fifteen thousand people receiving their novavax vaccine and this one is a vaccine which is made in insect cells amazingly and the way in which you do this is you take the gene for the outer coat of the spike of the coronavirus put that into a virus that infects insect cells and then use that to infect moth cells and they grow these in very large amounts in the culture dish and these cells then churn out enormous amounts of this spike protein from the coronavirus which can be purified and you then inject it, and it teaches the immune system how to recognise the uh, the the outer part of the virus that the virus uses to infect us. And it showed nearly ninety percent effectiveness in UK settings, including yep. against the UK new variant. But then reading further down the page, it said it also showed some promise in the South Africa variant because, of course, there's also a study ah. that Novavax are doing in South Africa. They got a phase right. two trial going on in, in South Africa, much smaller numbers, four thousand people. But the worrying feature that they highlight is that it's only 49% effective across the board in South Africa. And if you drill into the numbers, Mm. taking the most optimistic view, it's about 60% effective. And when you look at that, it seems to be the variant that's cropped up on the Eastern Cape now dominating the infections across South Africa appears to be less susceptible to their vaccine effect than the parent strain of the virus. And, And actually the chief executive of the company a bit like in that uh, in Jaws, in Jaws 1, where mm. Chief Brody mm. says, to, you're going to need a bigger boat. He turned around and said, we're going to need a new vaccine, basically, because it looks yeah. like the variant has changed sufficiently to thwart the immune response provoked by their vaccine. So, so that this it is the South well. African, the South African variant that has changed significantly. The one I got, basically, quite, quite possibly, variant. yeah. It lo- it looks yeah. a bit different. The shape of the virus um, spikes is sufficiently different that the response produced by the Novavax vaccine, at least, yeah, doesn't seem to neutralise across the board that particular variant. Other other uh, vaccines are of course available, and they do still appear to be working, as far as we can tell at the moment. But it's still a reminder that this thing's probably got more to give yet before we get rid of it. So we've we've got to persist with our efforts to, to stamp it out. Yeah, absolutely. You're listening to the Naked Scientist, Dr. Chris Smith. If you've got any questions about everyday life, it could be something that you've just noticed. You pulled the plug out, you're in the bath, and you noticed something, and you thought, huh, how does that actually work? You call in, and you ask the questions, Chris more than often, we'll have all those answers for you. And we do, we do, we, well, we, we do have some homework from last week that I didn't have yes, an answer do. to. And, and it was a very yes. interesting question. I said, I want to do it justice. The, the question was, if I've got mm. fillings in my teeth, is it theoretically possible I could tune into the local radio station using my mouth? Yeah. And it sounds like the kind of thing that uh, someone would make up for a joke. And in fact, there are many, many reports of this. 
And so I've been having a look into it. The first report actually was an American comedian who said that this happened to her in the 1940s. And we, we were never sure whether or not she was just saying this to, to get some attention or you know make a joke out of it. But but people have subsequently come up with, with this again and again and again. And I think the Mythbusters have tested this and they've concluded it's theoretically possible. And the mechanism behind this is if you have amalgam fillings in your teeth, they're metallic, obviously, and they can, with the electrolyte of the saliva, make a crude semiconductor junction which will have the effect of being able to rectify the radio waves coming from AM radio broadcasts and potentially cause vibrations. And this these vibrations could be amplified through the bones in in your jaw and your your head. And so in theory, you could possibly tune into a radio station, probably very, very unlikely, you're going to make it happen very easily. It's a rare occurrence. But it nevertheless has been reported by quite a few wow. people. There, then again, one source I did read uh, pointed out that about 3.9 million Americans think they've been abducted by aliens at some point. So you can't just go with the numbers game. Um, but there is a theoretical plausibility yeah. in, on physics, on, on, in terms of physics as to how this could happen. Thank you for that, Chris, and thanks for the research. Let's go to Marina in Durbanville. Hi, Marina. Hi. Um, yeah, I've got a question. Um, I've had covid and um, I didn't have, I just had painful lungs. I didn't cough once, nothing like that. And then a few days later, I had a cytokine storm, which was absolutely quite terrifying. I thought I was dying. It was really a bad one. And um, I've got veins that are protruding that weren't protruding before. But my main question is, is if I have the vaccine, will it stimulate my immune system in a peculiar way like that, or or what's it likely to do? I'm, I'm quite sort of scared of having the vaccine, but then I, I just can't make the decision. Hi, Marina. Uh, the way to think about this, and to reassure you, no, that won't happen. The way to think about this, when you have any infection, you make an immune response, which eventually kicks that out of your body. Now, in you right now, let's assume that that diagnosis is correct. You've definitely had coronavirus infection. You've now got immune cells making uh, uh, antibodies, which are washing around in your bloodstream. And you've also got white blood cells, which are in the bloodstream, that both of which together can find, ferret out and destroy virus and virus infected cells in the body. Now, if I come along with the vaccine, the vaccine educates the immune system about one part, the spike on the outer coat of the virus you've already got an immune response against that. And so all this will do is further consolidate or stimulate and strengthen the immune response you have made. And if you think about it, the effect of doing that is almost no different than if you go walking down the street and run into somebody tomorrow who's got coronavirus and they give the virus to you. Because if you are re-exposed to the virus it's doing exactly the same thing as if you are exposed to the vaccine and you probably given the prevalence in South Africa at the moment of the infection you probably have run into quite a few people since you recovered who've got it and you haven't had that happen so the likelihood of it happening from Mm. a vaccine is very remote indeed so you Mm. you probably should get the vaccine because if the original diagnosis was wrong you'll get protected if the information we now have that people's immunity does tend to dwindle with time then you should probably get the vaccine and that way if you also didn't make a good enough immune response to the original infection which some people don't and that's dwindled already you'll get protected so either way i'd I'd say the best thing to do is to go and get the vaccine if you're offered it i totally 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 agree with chris my mother is 75 she can't wait to get the vaccine yeah. I'm getting the vaccine too. And you know, if I grow another leg, I'll, uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to get the vaccine mm. um, without a doubt. I have no, you know, if I grow another leg, that's fine. I can run faster. But uh, no, <laughs> s- seriously, Marina, I think I think there's a lot of scaremongering going on around mm-hmm. the vaccine. And this is why I like mm-hmm. having Chris. And this is why we, we have really sane medical people on the show with us to, to, to mm-hmm. put things into, into perspective. I can promise you, uh, you know, and, and we hear about deaths, right? And, and, and it happens. But Chris said this the last time. Out of millions of people who've already received it, um, mm. you know, in the UK, for example, yeah, you, you have to take things uh, within context. Yeah. 
But you know, the funny thing is, or funny peculiar, mm. is that about two weeks afterwards, I went and had an antibody test. Yeah. And I didn't have a single antibody. What? Yeah. Okay. And that's, uh, Chris, by the way, what the, these antibody tests tell you, uh, you know, how many antibodies you have. What else can they can they read into that before uh, you maybe just touch on what, what she just said there, what Marina just mentioned? Well, the first thing I'd say is that no test is a perfect test. And there are tests that do a good job. There are also tests that miss things. And we know yeah. this happens. There are grey areas in tests and it's... It's all too common, unfortunately, that some tests miss stuff. And uh, especially with new things like this coronavirus, we haven't had decades of research to to optimise and develop really robust, really, really reliable tests, which do make sure they don't miss cases. So it's possible that either, number one, you didn't make any antibodies, unlikely if you've made an immune response and recovered and you really did have the infection. Number two, the test is broken and didn't work. And, or at least in you. And uh, number three, you didn't have coronavirus in the first place. You had something else in the test yeah. that told you you did have it was wrong. So all those possibilities exist. And this is why this is proving such a headache to get on top of, because the tests aren't very, very good. I mean, we, 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 we can detect the virus pretty well with our laboratory diagnostics. That's probably about 80% accurate laboratory PCR tests we're doing. But uh, many of these other tests are manufactured by enormous numbers of different organisations around the world. They miss cases. I mean, the lateral flow tests we're using to look for people who are actively infected right now, they, they miss about half of the cases of infection. And so w- when you've got that kind of accuracy, you, you have to take with a pinch of salt when you see results that seem unexpected. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Lots of questions to go through, and we'll go through those. Uh, by the way, if and Chris is on with us every week. He's taking the vaccine. If he starts sounding like Darth Vader, then you know there's a problem. But, I mean, he's going to be with us each and every week, and he'll be taking those particular questions that you have, and he'll be giving you the answers to them. Let's go to Paul. Uh, Paul is in Durban. Paul. Hi, Paul. A very good morning to you. Hi, Kio, and hi, hello to the doctor. Hi. Um, I read an article recently, it was a bit vague, and I just wanted some clarity, maybe the doctor knows. Um, the astro- astronomers have found, if you look at a cross-section through the dish of the Milky Way, they have found two bubbles, one above and one below. And I have a feeling the one was discovered quite a while back, but a second one has appeared or recently been discovered. I wonder if the doctor can just clarify what these bubbles actually are. I, I'm not familiar with, with uh, bubbles in our no. Milky Way. Um, I thought aero Uh. bars had bubbles in them and whisper bars, but um, I'll I'll take it that Milky Way is supposed to be light and fluffy, isn't it? Uh, I don't know the answer to this one. I haven't come across those reports. If you have a reference you can point towards me, then do please let me know and I'll take a look. Was it to do with dark matter, possibly, the reports that you were reading? Yeah, uh, yeah, it it was. They did mention that and it it looked like thermal bubbles, if you know what I mean. They were very faint in comparison to the dish. Okay. Um, I, it was actually I, a thermal image of it. Fair yeah. enough. Um, because the, the thing that um, we, all, we know about various galaxies is that they have halos of dark matter around them. And that's how we got to know that dark matter exists in the first place. Because Fritz Vicky, who was an astronomer who noticed that uh, many of the stars in remote galaxies are going around a lot faster than they ought to be. And normally, if you look at something moving, the rate at which it moves and the rate at which the stars are able to stay together is dictated by how much mass is holding them in place because of gravitational attraction. And many of these things are moving so fast that they should, if you can imagine a a person sitting on a roundabout that suddenly speeds up, they'd all be flung off. Um, These stars shouldn't be where they are, but they stay where they are when these galaxies are rotating. And that was the first insights into there must be something which we can't see, but which has a lot of gravity associated with it, which is holding them in place. And that then led to us being able to map out where the dark matter, this mysterious entity, makes up quite a high proportion of the mass of the universe, but we have no idea what it is. We can't see it. We just know it's there because it's gravitationally active. It doesn't interact with other stuff very well, so it's very hard to probe what it is and and what it's made of. But we know that it's associated with with galaxies and it forms an important part of the mass of galaxies and hangs on to stars. But I I don't know specifically if that was what was being referred to in your report. If you would like to send me the report, I'll gladly take a look and see if I can work it out. I'll have a look. If you go on Twitter, it's at Naked Scientists. Or um, you can find us yep. on nakedscientist.com, my website. There's a contact us bit, and you can put that in there, and it'll come through to okay. me. 
All right. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for that one, Paul. Let's go to Derek. Derek's in Durbanville. Hi, Derek. Hi, good morning. Complaints of the season. Complaints to you too, sir, as always. <laughs> <laughs> what, else, morning, what else do you do? What else do you do with an ANC government? But anyway, go for it. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what can you say? Yeah. Uh, my question. In a tsunami, what happens to all the fish and sharks and all those sideshows and funnies that are in the water? Because obviously the water sort of gets sucked away and then it comes back in with a hell of a, um, a force. What happens to the, 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 the fish in the water? Do they also come up and get spewed onto the land or... Are they are they somehow clever enough just to stay away from from that section? Because I mean, that force of the water is massive. Hi, Derek. Uh, first of all, many people, when when you say tsunami, they think of a, an enormous wave that you could surf on, like you see on beaches in Portugal and Hawaii and places like that. And that's not how tsunamis work. The waves that we see when we just go to the beach and we watch the waves rolling in. The distance between the waves, that's the wave length. So if you take the top of one wave and then the top of the next wave, that is the wave length. And it's, it's going to be a few metres. With a tsunami, that wave length is kilometres. And the reason for this is the usual cause of a tsunami is that something has displaced a massive amount of water upwards or downwards very abruptly in very deep water. And the most recent really important example was what happened almost a decade ago in Japan off the shore of Fukushima. Remember the famous nuclear power station? And there was a very big abrupt movement through hundreds of metres of a section of seafloor in a very deep portion of the ocean in the Pacific there. And that sudden movement displaced millions of tonnes of water through a big departure in, in terms of distance. And this when you're in very deep water, as a proportion of the depth of the water, the amount of movement up and down is tiny. But it's enough that as that propagates away, because it then starts to that, that movement then starts to move away from the site of origin, as it moves into shallower water, you then end up with that movement as a proportion of the depth of the water becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until it's basically all of the water. And so Rather than the big wave coming in, what you get is a, is a rising level of water that comes in like a high tide and it keeps coming in and it's like the tide just continues to come in because this wave is such a long wavelength that it doesn't suddenly reach a peak. So the water just comes up and up and up and it just inundates and comes in land. And as it comes in land, it will bring everything that is in the water with it. So there will be fish, there will be sharks, there'll be shellfish, there'll be marine creatures. Now, some of them will be alarmed by the fact that the sea floor is suddenly changing. They'll, they'll, they'll try and swim away from where that's happening. So some of the bigger things can take avoiding action and they won't be pushed, pushed ashore. The real damage is that as the water begins to inundate on the shore, it picks up loads of stuff and that stuff then has momentum and it gets used like a battering ram and it starts to smash up other things. And so the devastation is caused by the stuff that the water picks up once it makes landfall. But most of the marine creatures, uh, some of them will, will be in there, but most of them can just swim away as they, as they detect the fact that, that uh, in the same way as they would detect the shoreline and breaking water and the shallowing of water, they would swim the opposite way. They can swim away, so the really big stuff will escape. But, but many things would be pushed ashore and were, and then you end up with this horrible, stinking, rotting mess on the sea on the, on the seashore when the water then begins to retreat because obviously it comes in in that way and then it retreats in the same way as it came in, like a, a high tide but happening very fast. And, and obviously it leaves a lot of flooding in its wake because it's pushed enormous amounts of nasty, salty water lo laden with all this other stuff inshore. And that has to then drain out again, but it, but it will drain out and it then deposits all this stuff behind. And often it's hidden and covered up by all of the other debris that's, that's there, but it, it will be there. There will be, there will be unfortunately lots of dead sea creatures. The sharks won't be there. Uh, there, like there, were, there are going to be some, right? But, but sharks, if you think about it, sharks can detect, they're very, very good at detecting where the shoreline is, where the breakers are, how deep the water is, and sometimes make a conscious choice to go into that very shallow environment in order to hunt, for example. But most, most animals know that they're in trouble if, if they get into very shallow water. They can detect it and they can actually swim out fast enough to avoid it. It's not like they're swimming into a massive current that they can't avoid. They can actually take avoiding action because the water is coming in at a reasonable rate 
rate, but it's not such a current that they couldn't easily swim away from it. So many of these animals, the really big ones, will be able to take avoiding action because they can detect where the shoreline is and the fact that it doesn't smell very nice, it doesn't taste very nice, and it's also very turbulent. So they'll swim away and avoid that. Whereas some of the smaller stuff will, will be brought ashore. Again, a quick one from Paul in the CBD. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Hi, hi Kino. Hello, sir. I'll ask you a question. Hi. Dr. Christmas is listening to you. Yes, hi. Um, the new spacecraft they're sending up to Mars and whatever, using nuclear power. But what are they using the nuclear power to give thrust? Oh, hi, Paul. Um, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the, the actual story that you're referring to. Uh, for a long time, though, we've powered many spacecraft with nuclear generators. For instance, you'll probably have heard of the Voyager probes, many of which, are, well, um, both of which are, we're still in contact with, which were launched when I was, you know, just, just being born. And they, they are still communicating with the Earth. And the reason that they're still communicating with the Earth decades later and billions of kilometres out beyond um, where we are is because they have a big chunk of radioactive material in there. And this is hitched up to a thermoelectric generator. So when you have an intensely radioactive nuclear source, as it radioactively decays and spits out radiation and the atoms in their fragment as they break down under the effects of the nuclear decay they produce a lot of heat and there are materials which if you put heat on one side of the material and the other side of the material is kept very cold which of course it is in space so it's quite easy to do this you have a cold side and a hot side the thermal gradient across the material can be used to create a potential difference in other words electricity and that's how you use these things to generate electrical uh, current which can then be used to power your devices and because many of these intensely radioactive sources polonium plutonium for example they stay radioactive for a really long time with a high decay rate you you can have a very long term su sustainable reliable power supply and that that's how they do it there are also some uh, ion drive engines now which are using um radioactive decay to or of certain or, or the decay of certain substances to spit out atoms which you can then or heavy atoms which you can then accelerate with an electric field and if you accelerate something in one direction you get a push in the opposite direction and those those engines are, are also um, being used in certain contexts i'm not sure which one applies to the story you've heard but if you again have a reference uh, send it to me and i'll gladly take a look for you chris so that's where we're going to leave it so good luck with that vaccine i let you know, know which how one of you we got yeah, I don't know which one of we you're going to which one of you we're going to talk to next week, but <laughs> either way, one. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Take care, Kino. Have a good weekend. Cheers. You too, man. Dr. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist.